I'm Eric. Uh, I am a senior product manager uh, with a company called Splash. Um, I got laid off about two months ago, two, three months ago, and I just locked down this new position on Monday. Um, I'm here to hopefully give you guys a little bit of tricks, tips, tactics for how to break into product management, for how to break into tech. Um, I have been in the tech industry for about three years. I've been working in product management for about five. At least that's the story that I told when I was trying to break into product management. Um, so I have been in the shoes of somebody who is trying to get into the industry and sees how frustrating it is uh, trying to get somebody to give you that chance. So um, there's some things that I did that hopefully can help you guys. Uh, and again, I had very first-hand experience over the last few months uh, having just been laid off again. So I do want this to be more of an engaging conversation. I don't really want to just speak at you. So I'm curious like where you guys are in your journeys, where um, in the interview process maybe you're getting hung up, if it's at the resume stage, if it's at the offer stage, <laughs> or if it's at the, the middle ground. Um, yeah, I'm curious to, to know a little bit about your guys' backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm kind of starting from scratch, coming out of hospitality, career bartender server. Um, I have finished a product boot camp so far, and I guess I'm still on the point. I guess I'm still finishing up my last I was with you. But um, yeah, uh, before, I haven't shot out that many applications yet, but I guess like my next step is like Scrum Cert. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. So one of the reasons that I got into product management in the first place is because I saw that there wasn't really a major for it. Like the way that finance had uh, a, a co corporate finance track or marketing had a, a very specific track. Yes, there are product management uh, roles popping up in universities more often. Um, but what I saw is that there was a diverse set of backgrounds who got into that role. So engineers would become product managers, salespeople would get into product management, operations, um, hospitality, all of these different uh, roles would get into the field. So my headspace was, hey, if they could do it, maybe I could craft my background into something that would allow me to stand a chance. So my background, I was working in the travel industry uh, before getting into tech. And I had probably like my dream job at the time. Uh, essentially what I was doing is I was creating uh, trips abroad. So I would go to a new country that I've never been to. I would go to New Zealand or India or Japan and I would get hired to create a 10 day itinerary for our customers here in the States. And I would create an itinerary and then we would sell it to our customers here in, in the States. So it was a dream job. I, I got paid to travel the world and do all these amazing things. Very little overlap with shipping software. Um, <laughs> That being said, there were some things, some little nuggets in what I was doing that allowed me to craft a narrative around, hey, I have the skills or the soft skills to allow me to become a product manager. So the skills that, that I, again, it was all about the story that I was able to tell and through a lot of trial and error, I continued to refine that story. And the story that I got pretty good at telling was that I had to speak with customers to know which trips they wanted to go on, what kind of activities they wanted to go on in these places. I needed to understand the market. What was our competition doing? Were they offering these trips or were they not? All of these things are qualities that a product manager working in software need to have. We need to know the competition, we need to know the market, and we need to know our customers. So all of those things allowed me to craft somewhat of a narrative. So those were my strengths. On the gap side, I was also, I had to be very aware of what my gaps were. So my gaps were I didn't work in software. <laughs> I didn't work in tech. I didn't know technology that well. I didn't have a scrum team. I didn't have a group of engineers. I didn't know how to, how to lead engineers to create software. So as soon as I knew that those were my gaps, I sought to fill those gaps with things like certifications, with online courses. So the first thing that I did was I went out and I got a scrum product owner certification. Um, 
took a, I, I think it was like a week long course, got that certification, slapped it on my LinkedIn, put it on my resume. And again, once I started getting those interviews, it just supported the narrative of the story that I was building. So it showed that I was interested enough to invest my time and money into learning about this industry, being aware enough about my gap to know this. From there, the other gap that I identified was also technology. So I didn't know how to code. I didn't know how the ins and outs of a database worked. I didn't know how to run a query. So took some courses in SQL, took some courses in Python. Again, just trying to get my foot in the door, just trying to understand what this new industry was about. And ultimately, at the end of the day, what that allowed me to do was, again, craft that story that the person who eventually gave me the opportunity and let me um, try to be this PM in software, what he saw in me was hunger. And he saw that, sure, I didn't know how to manage a scrum team, but I was hungry enough to craft a narrative around this, to go out of my way to seek these courses, to seek these paid certifications, to support the gaps that I have in order to actually build on this career that I wanted to get into. So I think ultimately it just came down to that, that story that, that you're telling on your interviews, on your resume, and crafting it in a way that is getting the attention of the people that you wanted to. How do you tell them what they want to hear? So curious. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, is there anybody else who is in maybe the interview process or in a resume stage, or where, where are you guys getting hung up? Yeah. Um, so I was uh, just laid off in February. I was a product offer manager for seven years. So I was in the enterprise space, and I launched software, hardware, networking, storage, servers, everything. Um, I worked with a lot of product managers and a lot of uh, core teams. I, I feel like I have the skills to actually do the product management portion of it. But a product offer manager is not a product manager. So I, I can see from what you're saying that I would need to get, certainly get up on an agile. Right now I'm working on my PAP, but maybe I need to shift my focus on something else. Um, but if, and I have lots of experience with a lot of things, you know, that, that you mentioned. How difficult of a transition, it really depends on me and how I can sell the story. Yeah. Yeah. You can sell a story. You didn't Thank have you. any experience. Yeah. But uh, in hindsight, it sounds like I could sell a story. What you didn't see was the nine or ten months of constant rejection as I'm trying to craft that story. <laughs> so this was four years ago now, and again, I was constantly battling imposter syndrome and doubt, self-doubt, like why is anybody going to give me a shot? I don't know software. So I, I think, yes, it is about that story. And my biggest recommendation there is just put in your reps for how to narrate that, how to craft that story. And there's a lot of free resources to craft that story by putting in those reps. And my favorite one that I used the most over these last few months was just mock interviewing uh, with your peers. And you could mock interview with coaches. Uh, I did one. It cost me like $150 for the hour. So it wasn't really sustainable since I was laid off. I didn't have an income stream coming in. Um, so I, I found creative ways. And the creative way that I, I found it was like this, this free service. Again, I was interviewing product managers, and they were interviewing me. So it flexed two different muscles in my brain. I was able to put myself in the interviewer's shoes trying to judge this person, trying to see what they could do better so that I could almost see myself in them too. And then, of course, I was also practicing by telling my story. And I did that tons and tons of times. And eventually, it got better, I, I would hope at least. How many product managers did you interview long interviews with? A couple dozen, maybe like. How did I get access to them? Uh, so I would write this down if you guys are interested in this. It's called Stellar Peers. Um, and that is the soft or the system that I use the most. Um, essentially, what they do is um, they give you access to a shared calendar, and you just add your availability on that calendar. And then other product managers also have access to that calendar, and they will block off time with you. And on there, again, it's other people who are looking for jobs or other people who are just looking to practice interviewing. So you're both providing value to one another, and it's free. You're, you're literally just supporting one another. So that, I mean, that was like, those were my meetings when I was laid off. 
Um, another one uh, is Lewis Lin, also free paid, uh, free paid mock interviews. Um, that one I believe is a Slack group. Uh, they, it, it didn't uh, resonate with me as much because I just really like the simplicity of like, hey, this is my calendar availability. This is where I'm at. I can block off time with you. You can block off time with me. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I think she had her hand up. Yeah, I, I was just wondering. The mock interviews helped, but I will say that as a designer, you're in a much better place than I was at, trying to break into the industry without any software experience. Uh, you also have a lot of value because you've been with customers. You, you know how to craft some uh, visually appealing products that customers are going to want. So again, trying to identify those gaps and f uh, fill in those gaps. Um, in terms of the imposter syndrome piece, I think that um, what really helped me is a, focusing on those strengths, like knowing that I have certain strengths. Um, this kind of goes into more of like my personal stuff, but like affirmations are, are helpful. Surrounding yourself with community that is actually going to re-emphasize these things for you and remind you that in your feelings of doubt and, and lowness that, hey, you actually do have value to provide. You've done all these amazing things. Um, I also have this, again, kind of nerdy thing that I've just been keeping track of for the past like few years, but anytime I, I used to get like a nice Slack message from a coworker or something um, saying that, hey, you did really good at this, or you did really uh, awesome job with this project, I just took a screenshot and saved that because I knew that at some rainy day, I was not going to feel great about myself for some reason. And when you get laid off, there's a lot of days when you don't feel great about yourself. So just looking into that was helpful for me to remind myself that, oh, okay, I can actually provide value because I was a great customer interviewer when I had this role, or leadership really appreciated my recommendations, or I designed this incredible piece that uh, increased DAU by 30%. That's awesome. Like, let's, let's remember these things and go into these interviews and these conversations with that in mind, too. I think it's a lot harder now, yeah, to be blunt. I think it's a lot harder. There's a lot of people who, are, who got laid off, and there's a lot of people who um, are looking for jobs, especially at these big tech companies. Like, you're competing with Meta and Netflix and all these other, all these other people now. Um, and it was a concern of mine. But again, I didn't do any rocket science here to, to make it happen. I'm here to hopefully give you some of like the things that I did to, to share with you. So like if I can do it, like other people can do it too. Again, we each have different backgrounds and we each come from different places. But I think with enough perseverance and with just like sticking to a certain system of like, hey, this is going to work, believing in myself and just accentuating those strengths, you'll get there eventually. It will be hard. <laughs> and it was hard when market conditions were great. It's even harder now. But I, I think, like, at the end of the day, you're still working on yourself and you're still working on your skills. You're not losing anything by getting into these mock interviews and working with these people, supporting them and having them support you. I think he was next. Sorry. I was just going to add to the, to, to the support groups. Um, there, and I have no connection to this other than this works so well that I supply it to my students now. Awesome. Uh, Kurt, did you use Expo? I have used Exponent. Uh, again, it was paid uh, yeah. coaching, so yeah. I didn't use it that well, much. Uh, but even, even the, the product itself is only like $100 per year. So. Oh, yes. Um, I thought about investing in it, but I think I've just found free alternatives, yeah. and I just dove into those. Yeah. But that is a really good place if you just want all of your interviewing prep to come from one place. They, they did a great job con just consolidating all of it. Yeah, we, our students like this. So yeah. We subscribe to it. Yep. I think it's tryexponent.com. 
Um, and then the other, probably their main competitor is igotanoffer.com. Both of them offer, uh, yeah, I know, <laughs> straight to the point. Um, both of them offer uh, mock, sorry, uh, coaching and I believe online courses as well. Yeah, it's like they'll, they'll, they'll train you specifically on how to prepare for an interview with Google, that type of thing. Right, they, exactly. They, they break it down into a very refined level. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I was curious, like you, uh, you said, like somebody ended up seeing like that you were like hungry, even though you didn't have like experience with marketing product. Mm -hmm. You, what audiences are more receptive to that kind of thing? I would say what really helped me with that company too is some of the things that I did like five years prior to that too. So I think. It also comes down to finding alignment between what you've done and what you're interested in and what they're looking for. So speaking directly from my personal example, this company, it was called Jungle Scout. Um, they gave me my first opportunity into tech. And what they did was they helped Amazon sellers sell online by providing data around what has high demand and low competition online. Um, the reason that I say alignment was really helpful was because just by happenstance, I had happened to write, uh, publish two eBooks on Amazon like four years prior to that. So I had experience selling on Amazon. I had experience like navigating through the ecosystem of what they're trying to help their customers do. So it, again, it, it took probably 100 different companies before I got to this place where, oh, there's maybe a semblance of alignment here because I've done these things that their customers know and again, crafting that story, crafting that narrative, putting in those reps. All of those things came together in a way that I was able to get that chance. Yes? How many months were you in the course? Uh, just now? Uh, about three? Yeah. And then when you were first trying to break into the product, that was um, during, so I got laid off right around COVID, when COVID hit, like March 2020 or something. Um, I was unemployed for about three weeks, um, but I was looking for product management roles for about eight months because I was ready for my next shift. So I think I had just, I, I guess I was lucky with the fact that I was dedicating myself to trying to break into this industry, happened to get laid off during COVID, and then pretty quickly was able to get this, this opportunity with Jungle Scout. I was already on the track because I knew that I wanted to shift away from travel. I knew that I wanted to get into tech. I knew that there was a lot of opportunity there. Um, something that I really value is being a fully remote worker and just being able to travel and like be a digital nomad and bounce around the world. I've traveled to 45 different countries, mostly while working abroad and working odd hours. Um, and funny to say, and almost ironic, but that travel company was moving away from remote work and they wanted to bring me into the office. So <laughs> weird, but uh, that was like a, a red line for me. So I was like, I, I can't do this. That and the fact that I just, I saw a lot of opportunity in tech. There's obviously high salaries, like movement, um, remote work, uh, interest, like technology is something that's interesting to me because it's, it's I mean, it, it just, uh, there's such a wide array of use cases. You could be in business, healthcare, finance, whatever you want. So it just presented all of these opportunities for me. So yes, I was already looking to make a shift, and I think the fact that I was looking made that unemployment gap a lot shorter, fortunately. What's your degree? Uh, business administration. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes? Uh, I'm in a little bit different track. I'm actually a technical program manager now, but to get into that field, I was a technical writer first, I got laid off, and then I made the jump to project management. Mm -hmm. But to do that, I had to take a career in financial hit to make the jump. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious in your experience, when you went from one field to the other, like where were you able to break in? Was it a pretty junior role? I mean, you've advanced yourself since. Like, how did that work for you? Yeah, uh, I got in at the product management level, so above associate PM, just right at the entry-ish uh, PM role. Um, again, I was able to tell them and craft that business narrative in a way that they didn't put me into an APM role. Also, they weren't hiring an APM, they were hiring a PM. So the fact that I did have the, at least the fundamental skills of a product manager in terms of like speaking to customers, knowing the market, knowing the competition, understanding all of these things, I think helped me in a way. And 
after a year and a half with them, I got promoted to senior PM. And then from there, um, I just bounced to a blockchain company. And then that was the blockchain company that I got laid off at in January. And now I'm at an event marketing company. So still senior PM. Um, I think ideally, I already expressed this to my manager, I'm looking to hopefully get a promotion within the year. I'm, yeah, again, just tying back to like why I got into this field in the first place is like there is a lot of opportunity. And as a product manager, you hold a lot of leverage too. So you put your name on a lot of things. So when things are successful, you're in the spotlight. When things are not successful, you're the, you're the kicking bag. So that, that's, like, that's part of the role. So you kind of have to know that going into it and you have to be uh, aware enough. But with that risk reward ratio, there's a lot of upside with it too. So again, it's another reason why I decided to get in here. Yes. So <clears throat> I've been in tech for about four years, but I've only been on a product team as a product owner for about eight months. So I'm still relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, before that, I was teaching. So I guess my question is, as someone who is new or about to be new to product, what do you recommend like, to stay in <laughs> Yeah. Um, like upskilling or um, do you have any advice for that? Yeah, I think that the, the piece that really um, as a product manager, you're connecting with so many different people, so many different people across the org. You're connecting with sales, marketing, products, everything. So I think being somebody that has enough empathy to understand where all of these other departments are coming from, when they're coming to you with requests, when they're coming to you with complaints, I think is a really important skill. And you see it on every single job application or job description is communication, having customer empathy, and some people just kind of breeze right past it, and I do too. It's like, oh, communication. Yeah, of course, I, I have communication. I can communicate. But when you get to, to, to the, the, when you get really in it, then you really understand that in order to continue leveling up, you need to have earned the trust of your organization. You need to have earned the trust of your stakeholders. And you do that by understanding where they're coming from. Why does the salesperson keep bothering you about this bug that is barely a problem for you? It's because his customer isn't, or his prospect isn't going to close unless you fix this bug or unless you submit this feature request. So how can you uh, make sure that you are giving him a timeline or some level of certainty while also uh, sticking to the roadmap that you have uh, put your name on? So finding a way to be empathetic with different lines of business is very tricky because there's sometimes a lot of competing interests. But if you can do that tactfully, then what you're doing is you're creating a support system within the organization for you. And with that, you, you gain a level of trust that will just continue to up-level you. So I think part of the reason that I got promoted is because I, like within a year and a half, is because I earned the trust of my manager, I earned the trust of other CSMs, that when they spoke to me, they knew that I was going to look at that, I was going to give them a timeline, I was going to make, most of the time tell them no, but I was going to tell them no with a reason. And this is what you can do to work around it while we get to that solution. So I think empathy is, is, is really crucial uh, across the board. Yeah. So when you first made your switch into it, um, did you have a mentor where you would feel a little more confident or assuming that you still had a guy that had an imposter syndrome? Yeah. Even if I got the role, the starting role. Yeah, when I first got the starting role, How uh, yeah, so fortunately I had a great manager. Um, he was the one who, funny enough, I had five rounds of interviews to get into the, the industry, and he was the only interviewer that I thought didn't like me. And after we developed a relationship a year later, he told me that he did, and he was actually my biggest advocate. So again, kind of like the imposter syndrome, like all in your head and kind of thing. Um, but that being said, he was, he's highly intelligent, and I, I really looked up to him. So he served as that mentor person. He had started a company before. He was in product management for like 15, 10, 15 years or something. So even today, I still think like, what would a BSEC do in this situation? So having that person to like, okay, he's communicating in this way with stakeholders. He's making these decisions with this data and these are the metrics that he's tracking to make sure that he gets to this result. So having somebody within the organization would be ideal to like look up to would be great. Um, if you don't have that, uh, what I also did beforehand was I came to things like this. 
Um, actually, somebody who's speaking here today, Dan Corbin, I don't know if you guys have been to his, his talks. Um, I haven't seen him yet um, here, but he was a mentor of sorts to me when I was trying to break into the industry. Um, I came to his talks, I, I came to his, his meetup groups. Um, he's still giving product management talks, um, but I, I, I learned from him a lot, and I continuously understood like how he was seeing his success so that I can try to mimic that in my own self. So just having somebody to, to, to mirror in a way, while putting your own uh, flavor into things, I think has been really, really helpful too for that imposter syndrome. In your experience, what, what background prepares you best for the product management role? Is it the engineer who's you know, usually the first to jump on a customer call, or is it the marketing guy, or is it the yeah. sales guy? I don't think that there's one best. I I don't know, there, there might be people who disagree with me there, but I don't think that there's one best because I've worked with product managers who, like some of my favorite product managers have come from engineering, other product managers have come from sales, other product managers went to, to like, get a master's degree in product management, and they all come with varied interests and, and varied experiences. Um, me not being a technical PM, I have some envy of people who come from an engineering background because they know the ins and outs of how the technology works so well. And a lot of the time I get my best ideas from my engineering uh, partners. So I, I really like that track. But again, I don't think that there is a perfect way. I, I, I think that it's so varied. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. So I was in that game session. So to me, it um, when I'm hearing there's a lot of uh, like a front end uh, mm -hmm. product discovery work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen, I'm just wondering then, did you get into this not fully understanding, but and then the, the, these two different stages? Yeah. Because uh, I think there's a lot to learn in <laughs> both of them. Yeah. And I'm just wondering too, what, the reason why I asked about the mentor, I think some companies have, uh, the product manager has different roles bearing in companies. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think my long rambling is it's kind of like, I'm kind of also curious, like from your experience transitioning, have you found that a lot of your work is in the product development and do you have like 10% or 30% in that front end? So I would really recommend reading the book Inspired. Um, inspired oh. by Marty Kagan, I believe. Um, it's a fun, it's like a PM, like fundamental uh, book. It's highly recommended. Um, what he speaks about is the idea of the product discovery process and the product delivery process. And he has a visual where there are two spinning wheels and they're operating in unison. Because as a product manager, you're consistently doing product discovery work while also focusing on the delivery of your product. So again, it's, it's a lot of work <laughs> because you're, you're trying to figure out what the next best thing is going to be. As a product manager, your role is to determine what you're building and why you're building it. So, Figuring out that what and the why is what you're doing in the discovery phase. You're speaking to customers, you're speaking with your stakeholders, you're really trying to understand what is the best idea that is really going to move the needle for the company. And then in the delivery phase, you're working really, really hand in hand with your engineering team, with your designers. And you're at that phase, you've already validated an idea and it's in production, so we're, we're getting it out. So you're doing both of those at the same time because you're not going to stop working on a feature to start working on another one and you're not gonna start working on like some future state and leave everything uh, on pause. So it's your job to make sure that both of those things are operating in unison. So I would say, I don't know, 50-50 maybe, in terms of discovery and delivery, uh, because both are very crucial to your success and the company's success in general. Awesome, anything else? Yes, maybe, no, all right. Uh, Yes, go ahead. And witnessing you through all of this, um, I might have more attention than it needs, but I just want to say that Eric has been, through all of the continuous work that he's done and putting it into his schedule, what this is really coming down to is his heart and mind is on you. And if you can find that, you're going to be successful in anything you do. And if you found that in everything you do. So his heart is like huge, and everyone else has that. This is a human thing. Thank you, thank you. Um, 
Awesome. I don't know how much time I have left. What, one, one more minute. One more minute? Oh, wow. We, we nailed it, guys. Awesome. <laughs> All right, well, um, guys, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I have my QR code. I'll leave it out right here for you guys. Um, I'd love to chat afterwards if there's anything that I could send you to help you on the interviewing process, during the resume process. Again, I've, I've been there. I know how difficult it is to try to get in to tech, into a PM role, to, to gain that trust, to get somebody to give you a chance. So I, I, I've, I empathize with the, the struggle that, that it can feel like sometimes. So yeah, feel free to reach out, and if there's anything that I can do to help you guys, I'm, I'm more than happy. Awesome, thank you.